So why is the XMP on your PC not working, especially with DDR5 and when trying to run four sticks? I mean, you might have experienced crashes, bugs, all sorts of weird things when trying to run XMP or Expo on your PC. Well, there's a few reasons why this might not be working and there's actually simple fixes and tools what you can do to actually fix that. And in order to help you understand XMP and solve the XMP issues, I've teamed up with JJ from ASUS and I've put together the ultimate guide to understanding XMP and some of the tools how to fix these things. So if you're a beginner or maybe a complete enthusiast who've already known all sorts of things in the PC industry for years and years, I'm sure you can learn something new about this conversation about XMP with JJ. Because DDR5 is slightly different than previous generations. And if I work for Linus, I'd say something the likes of, do you know what else is different? This sponsored segment. What? He does not. But I don't, so I'm not gonna say that. Looking for a cheap way to license your Windows? Check out WhoKeys through the links in the video description. Make sure to use the code TN20 to get a 30% off. Paste the license to the activation settings and you're all done. This license is for Windows 10, but you can upgrade it to Windows 11 for free. They also offer Microsoft Office 19 license. Use the same code TN20 to get a 30% off. Check out WhoKeys.com in the video description below. Could you give a little bit of a background where you work? How did you end up there? A little bit of a background, what kind of position you're in at ASUS? Yeah, so I've been with ASUS for a pretty good chunk of time, just about almost 15 years. So um, I've been able to see the company grow uh, and evolve in a lot of ways. I've actually handled quite a number of different roles. Uh, probably the most uh, kind of, I'd say, involved roles that I've had have been uh, coordinating with our product marketing team and our headquarters team in terms of kind of product feature design and development and, and community engagement and kind of bringing that all together holistically. Um, my current kind of role or designation is the Senior Technical Product Marketing Manager for ASUS North America. And like I said, that covers a lot of different aspects in terms of ultimately what I do. But, um, you know, the main kind of, I'd say, focus is one to engage with our product marketing team uh, as we go to market with new products, such as, let's say, a new motherboard launch, a chipset launch, help to be able to provide kind of insight in terms of how uh, the community, amongst how users, amongst how techno media will evaluate, look, and kind of ultimately adopt our products and help to have them a better understanding of it um, and you know that uh, like I said that it, because of ultimately what we're trying to do there's a lot of things that kind of ultimately fall into that from my side in terms of just being a PC DIY enthusiast and somebody has to inform myself and understand things but at the end of the day hopefully what I'm trying to do is help to provide more insight and edification regarding our products and our technologies as a whole. So when it comes to uh, RAM and XMP compatibility what is your experience being in ASUS about that or how do you link into that? Yeah, so that's a really interesting topic because it involves um, a couple of different ultimate narratives when you talk about kind of XMP. So one of the kind of the really good things at first of trying to understand is what XMP is. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of kind of, I'd say, conjecture or even misinformation in terms of sometimes how people try to understand what it is. And in short, really what XMP is, is an overclocking profile. And it's important to always add an overclocking profile at the very beginning of that conversation. And the reason being is that uh, overclocking is for one is never guaranteed and it's not part of the base specification design of a CPU product, right? Um, and so essentially what that means is that when you talk about either Intel or AMD, uh, when they are designing the actual CPU, um, and this has been now the case for multiple years, so multiple generations for both Intel and AMD, you have something that's called an IMC or the integrated memory controller. So that's the part that's inside of the CPU, we're not thinking about, you know, the cores or the cache or kind of maybe the traditional parts of uh, the CPU that a lot of times get talked about when you're talking about performance, but they heavily influence performance. So that integrated memory controller has a defined set of operating specifications. And essentially this is done to help to ensure that if you were to have 100 CPUs are produced, or of course an Intel and AMD situation, they're producing thousands of them, right? Um, you want to be able to ensure that they meet a guaranteed level of operation. So there's actually something I want to show here that hopefully will make this a little bit clearer uh, when you talk about actually memory and the IMC in general. But you can definitely always reference this information directly on the product page from uh, either Intel or AMD. It's actually called the Intel Port Table. Uh, AMD does also have one. So if you were to go to their website, you'd be able to find this information. Uh, this one right here is for Intel 12th gen, but it would be you know, a little, little bit different, but uh, the same format would apply essentially for um, Intel 13th gen. And what you're seeing right here 
is the Intel default port table. So essentially the operating set of specifications that the memory is designed for. So we see right here, uh, we have a couple of different terms. Uh, this is one slot per channel, one DIMM per channel, and then memory rank. And we'll touch on that in a little bit because it is going to be part of the conversation. Um, but the main thing that a lot of people you're aware of is this kind of, uh, let's say, frequency number or this bandwidth kind of number right here, um, right here. So this is 4800 MT. Uh, that's what the default was for 12th gen. And then on, of course, Raptor Lake uh, 13th gen, it went up, right? Um, but the interesting part here is you'll notice that depending on the configuration that you have uh, for your system, that actually number will go down. So it doesn't mean that there's a guaranteed kind of consistent number regardless of the configuration. And this isn't something that's new for DDR5. It actually also existed for DDR4 and for DDR3. It always has a difference based on a couple of different factors. And we'll touch on those factors in a little bit. But the main thing with XMP is XMP is whatever is beyond that set specification. So if you went and bought a kit of 52 or 56 or 64, these are all XMP kits, right? And they all carry some other value points uh, that ultimately allow them to operate at that. I like that. I'd like to take a little bit of a step back uh, to, to actually talk about RAM because a lot of people may not exactly know what is RAM and what is uh, RAM stick? What is XMP? Um, what does it stand for? And how is this utilized in a PC? So could yep. you uh, maybe give an overall overview of what is RAM? How how what is that part of the you know PC? Because we know CPU is computing unit, right? Yep. We have a GPU graphics unit. What is RAM? Yeah. So I mean, in short, it's pretty much it's your random access memory. Um, you want to just think about it that it's all about kind of the proximity of how the system works with the components that it has available to it, right? And so right here, you know, my system next to me, or of course, in the laptop that I'm running this from, right? They Every system we have always, always going to have kind of this hierarchy of how it has essentially a storage space to be able to run applications from in. On the CPU, the closest form of storage is gonna be cache, right? And then the next closest form is gonna be the system memory or the, the random access memory. And that's usually what's referred to in like your configuration of like 16 gigabytes or 32 gigabytes, 64 gigabytes. And then you got your SSD, right? Those are your three generally points of storage in your system. The RAM though, um, it is generally gonna be the most dense in terms of letting us run applications because cache usually is only literally in the megabytes. We don't get gigabytes of cache yet on CPUs. So, um, you know, applications have to be really, really sensitive about how they load and they work in with cache. And once they're no longer able to work in cache, they're working inside of our applications. And I always try to visualize this from the perspective, you know, I think a really easy way to look at this is probably something that's like literally opening up your task manager, right? You open up your task manager, you're able to visualize your memory, right? You can literally see right now on my system, I'm using 9.1 gigabytes worth of memory. I can see that there's a footprint that's on there. I can see my speed. I can see that corresponding information, right? Um, and that that's what its job is at the end of the day. Whatever you're running, whether they're, you know, it's Adobe Premiere or whether it's your browser or whether it's, you know, a streaming app, doesn't matter. It's all going to be running inside of system memory. So now we know when the XMP is on and, um, you know, we've got the RAM. We know kind of what the RAM is. Could you explain us um, what is the different parts that can affect the XMP profile of the RAM? So, you know, we've yeah. got a RAM kit that is saying 5,600 mega transfers per second. And also, what is the difference between mega transfers per second and megahertz per second? Yeah, so this ultimately is just, um, this one's a kind of a more kind of idiosyncratic kind of point within the industry, it pretty much just comes down to how you decide you want to define um, the operating metrics for the memory. So the correct term, right, is generally going to be mega transfers per second, right, as opposed to megahertz. Um, and this just has to do with actually the bandwidth versus, let's say, the clock cycles, right? And so the easiest way, again, if you kind of bring up an application is, you know, if you bring up a utility, commonly people are looking at something and maybe like CPU-Z or, like I said, I should there in the task manager, you can actually also bring up the information. Um, if you're looking at it from a frequency perspective, you have to add a kind of a multiplier. Uh, so you have to multiply some Thing. So an example of this would be like 1600 and then you would multiply that times two because you have a double data rate or DDR, right, is memory. You multiply that by two and then you would end with your effective output. Um, and for a long time, that's kind of what people were kind of defaulting to. But ideally, really, when we talk about memory, the end goal of what the bandwidth is, um, the mega transfers is what we want to try to actually convey. And so uh, within DDR5, now that we have a new specification, that's what's effectively trying to be communicated at this point. Prior question to that, right, though, in terms in terms of what really kind of influences um, memory 
that one's a really interesting one because a lot of the times uh, people will, again, generalize an, uh, kind of certain assumptions on what they think is going to assure them a certain level of performance. And a great example is, let's say right here, so I've got a, just a kit of memory. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, whether we're talking, you know, uh, G-Skill, Kingston, Patriot, uh, Crucial, any one of the great memory manufacturers that are out there, this is going to be applying unilaterally. Uh, but they'll have, you know, a little label on there. Uh, it'll be some type of XMP profile. And they'll kind of think in their minds, uh, you know, I, right, they go, okay, I think you said 5,600, um, it's 5,600 MT, my motherboard, I look on the motherboard, the spec sheet says 5,600 MT, and then I'll even maybe check the QVL, and it says 5,600 MT, so it should all work, right? Actually, no, um, and that's because uh, we actually have to look at a couple of different things that ultimately influence what allows the memory to effectively run. So the first one um, is gonna be the memory itself, right? Um, so when we talk about the memory, uh, there are gonna be a few things. One is going to be the ICs. So those are the chips that are literally on the memory. Uh, these can come from different companies. So um, generally gonna be three companies at this point. You have Micron, Samsung, and SK Hynix are gonna make your chips. Then another part of this is gonna be you said IC. What does IC, IC stand for? Uh, integrated circuit. Uh, but for it, most people, it's easiest to kind of just refer to it as, you know, those memory memory chips, right? Um, you're then also going to have other parameters that influence that, uh, including even the PCB layer count. Um, just like in motherboards, there's layers uh, that exist. And the more layers you have generally allows for better signal integrity performance. Um, because kind of like when you're routing these paths, if you make the layers less, right? So if you go from like a six layer to an eight layer to a 10 layer, um, it can be more complicated to optimally route a short path, uh, which would give you better signal quality. Um, and just kind of think about it like if you're driving, right? If you had to kind of go through the back roads as opposed to kind of like an immediate, uh, you know, path that you could just drive your car right around something and you'd be, you know, where you need to get to, right? Um, some memory might be, eight layer, some memory might be kind of 10 layer. Um, but the, the end point is ultimately is with that memory, it's pre-checked, right? So you're like, okay, hey, it should work. The tricky part then is if you move to the next part would be the motherboard. The motherboard influences things. Um, it also similarly can have a different layer count. It can have what's called a, a topology. So the way that the actual traces are laid out. So um, the traces just are essentially uh, lines that are on the motherboard that are routing information from the memory to the CPU. Um, and that, that can heavily influence things. And then there's also the firmware, uh, or what some people refer to as the UEFI firmware, or some people still call the BIOS 2. Uh, that is the software experience, and that also determines memory, um, the memory performance compatibility. The last part that people forget about, though, is the one that we talked about in the very beginning, which will be the IMC, uh, the integrated memory controller. So you can essentially pre-vet the memory itself, right? Because, you know, let's say the memory manufacturer has done that for you. They pre-checked it. They are able to confirm that it runs at that speed. Uh, the motherboard manufacturer, like us, we're able to pre-check and design our board to be able to be confident that it can run at that speed. Um, but what you can't pre-check is going to be that CPU. That CPU uh, is always going to have some variance in terms of the values that it can get to. Um, now, that doesn't mean that when you pick the memory that there isn't memory that might be a little bit of a better target to get to, but it does mean that there's more variance. So essentially, there's kind of three main things, and then there's a lot of little subsets within those that influence the ability for that memory to run. So when we are looking at, let's say, the same kit of RAM and then let's say this is 6,000 MTs, right? And then we're using this on our system and we're not getting stable performance, let's say in one CPU, but we get exactly the same CPU, same model, and then it works on the second CPU. Can you explain us why this might be and what is a silicon lottery and does it also affect the ICE, uh, integrated memory control of the CPU? Yeah, so that's actually exactly what happens. So it, you know, a great way to kind of evaluate this is if you know you kind of took 10 CPUs. So if you as a user, if you could actually buy 10 of them, you would probably run into that if you checked each one, even though all of them, if we again go back to that port table, we know they all can run, let's say at 4,800 or in the case of the you know 13th gen, that might be 5,600 MT, right? Um, or on AMD, you know, again, the rate is memory specification. Um, if you took 10 CPUs and you put them all together, they could all guarantee to run at that minimum base spec speed. But what you would start to notice is a delineation between one and another if you start going at faster speeds. So to your point, like 6,000, uh, we saw, take for instance, like in 12th gen, that probably approximately about 75%, maybe almost 80% of CPUs could hit a 6,000 MT memory divider 
um, in terms of stability, right? And so this doesn't just mean posting. It means post, boot, and use. So there's always three levels to how memory can work. And you, and you can't kind of um, forget about one because just because your system could post at a speed doesn't mean that it's going to boot at that speed. And when it boots at that speed, doesn't even mean that it'll be stable at that speed. Um, so you actually always have to account for all three. Um, but uh, to my point, in terms of the percentage, about 75 to almost 80% were able to go from that 4,800 to about 6,000, right? And then um, when we went to th uh, Raptor Lake or 13th gen, that 6,000 actually went all the way up to about 7,000 plus. So it was a big jump up in terms of the amount of kind of consistent CPUs that could overclock to that speed, right? But there will be CPUs that will be under that margin and there will be CPUs that are over that margin. And uh, you know, a lot of people talk about it as the Silicon Lottery. Uh, we term it Silicon Variance, maybe sounds a little bit uh, more PR friendly, right? But that's what it is, it's just variance between parts, right? Some parts can run a little bit more and some parts can run a little bit less. And we see the same thing within CPU frequency. A lot of people understand that when they like buy a CPU, if they were to overclock it, not all the CPUs are the same, right? Some will overclock maybe to like that six gigahertz and some might overclock only like 5.8 gigahertz, right? And so that's just an, again, it's an inherent difference. You mentioned Intel here, but what about AMD and their memory controller? Where did they slot in in the 12th gen, 13th gen? Yeah, so um, of course they're a little bit newer in terms of now DDR5. Uh, Intel has now had two generations. Uh, AMD only has now one generation in terms of DDR5 memory. Um, and they're also still making enhancements. Both companies actually do release um, what is called MRC or memory reference code, which helps to influence um, say like the interoperability and compatibility for memory that a motherboard manufacturer has to work with along with their own designs. Uh, for AMD, if we actually bring up their table, we can take a look at this. Um, and this is an interesting point as well, because uh, when you bring up the value a lot of times for AMD, there's been discussion on like everybody going, oh, like uh, 66, uh, excuse me, 6,000 MT is the sweet spot. Uh, for the memory, and that's what I should buy. Um, I don't necessarily uh, like using that term, uh, and the reason why is I don't think you can have a sweet spot when it is not the uh, guaranteed operating spec. To me, sweet spot has to mean that you have to be able to run. So if we took a look here at this um, uh, table here from AMD, we can see that their base speed is 5200, right? But can actually go all the way down to 3600 depending on the rank the density and the population of the memory. Um, now, again, that doesn't mean that just like when we talked about on the Intel side, you can't get uh, CPUs uh, like a 7700X or 7900X to be able to run at 6000 MT, uh, but there will be variants. Um, and we see right now probably that percentage is fairly similar. Um, I'd probably say it's maybe around 70%, 75% uh, in that range uh, that most um, most Ryzen series CPUs essentially will be able to run at 6000 MT. But the critical part to that is just like the Intel, if you noticed, is the slots per channel, the DIMMs per channel, are, or what people generally think of when they talk about memory is just like two sticks of memory versus four sticks of memory. Two sticks of memory um, is always going to be much higher in terms of its scaling potential. Um, and four DIMMs is always going to be lower in terms of its scaling potential, right? So that just means that that number that I talked about, uh, that, you know, 70 or 80% marker, that's in that, uh, that's only in that two DIMM configuration, not in that four DIMM configuration. So there is, I think, also misconception or s sometimes people don't understand what means four DIMM sticks and four channels and dual channel and four yeah. sticks in there. So you mentioned this already that when we have four sticks on the motherboard, because a lot of motherboards these days come with four sticks and you think, mm -hmm. look, I've got four channels, but uh, that is not exactly true as you um, already know. Could you explain why there are four dim sticks uh, or dim slots on some of the motherboards and then yep. most of the mainstream CPUs are actually dual channel and how does this actually work and why why does it go down in terms of the memory um, supported frequency or XMP or clock speeds when we are entering to that four sticks? So I think the, the first one, right, that we want to tackle there is just, um, you know, the point in terms of kind of the dual channel versus like, let's say quad channel. And that's ultimately defined by the, again, the IMC, 
um, so your CPU, so your platform. Um, all mainstream platforms that are available from Intel and from AMD are all dual channel. There's no quad channel. Um, so you only go into quad channel type memory specification when you're going into the high-end enthusiast desktop. So uh, for uh, Intel, uh, that would be like the X299 chipset, which will be replaced in the not too distant future. And then on uh, AMD side, right, that would be Threadripper, Threadripper Pro based platforms, right? So like TRX40, uh, WRX80, right? You go into more memory channels. Um, but for all the mainstream series users, those are all going to be dual channel. Uh, so that's the first part that kind of uh, just keep that in mind, right? Is that's influenced by the CPU. Now, as far as the uh, DIMM slots, right? Why do you have two versus having four? Technically, there's no uh, like, I'd say uh, formalized reason as to why you have to have four, right? Uh, we as a memory mother as a motherboard manufacturer can produce boards that only have two slots, like our uh, Z790 Apex board, or take for instance, or like a mini ITX board. Um, although generally a mini ITX, you're doing it because you're more constrained just in terms of physically space. Four, I think actually became the reason why you saw it so common and why it's even maintained its place within the industry is because of memory density. And what I mean by that is literally the amount of memory that you have. So as a user, right, when you're buying memory, that's the way you think about it. You think about it in terms of density or the capacity, right? So 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes, 64 gigabytes. Well, not that long ago, even to get to like 32 or like 64, it might have been that you had to go with like a four DIMM configuration, right? And even years back, even in a four DIMM configuration, you could have not even got 64. You, you would have had to go to like a high end enthusiast desktop and had to have like a motherboard that had like six or eight DIMM slots to even be able to get to 64. Uh, DDR5 has made this quite interesting because the density for DDR5 is really moving up quite quickly, but that's part of its um, benefit as a new specification, right? Right now, uh, we're moving into DDR5 can give you 64 gigs in two DIMMs, and in the not too distant future, you'll be able to get 128 gigabytes in two DIMMs, right? Um, so the value proposition is going down a little bit in terms of why you supposedly have to have four, but there is a reality that has happened over the last few years that people love aesthetics in their PCs when they're building them. And so a lot of people like the aesthetic of a four DIMM population. Um, so while it doesn't necessarily offer a technical merit, uh, outside of density, right, you can still have, of course, more memory with four slots than you can have with two slots. What we see most people actually adopting four DIMMs is not generally because of density. Now, you, 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 a lot of your users, uh, a lot of your viewers, they are creators, so they might maybe be in configurations where they maybe need 128, but to be honest, even for, uh, definitely photography, I'd almost say it's, it's almost no scenario you would need 128 for photography, really only 3D animation, professional uh, videography, uncompressed workflows, we need that density in memory. Um, but that's really what it breaks down to, right? Is that if you need the density, you would go with four, um, but if you want really, I think, good density, but high scaling, you definitely want to go with two. And uh, the last point, excuse me, I think the last question was, why is it harder? Uh, this one gets a little bit tricky without getting to too much of the minutia, but an easier way to, I think about it is kind of like weights, right? If I was to give you um, two five pound weights, right? Uh, or versus two 10 pound weights versus two 40 pound weights, which one's gonna be easier for you to lift, right? The one that's lighter, right? And that's pretty much what you're doing is that you're asking the memory controller to address and to hold a lot more memory at a faster speed and that's much more strenuous. So density will also affect that value. So even when we talked about two DIMMs, that still plays a part. So um, if you go from like, a, right now the best performing kits, if you talk about scaling, are gonna be a 32 gigabyte kit. That's where you're like, you can go like 6,000, 66, 7,000, 76, almost even 8,000 uh, with, with really good boards and really good CPUs. But that's not gonna be with the 64 gigabyte kit. The 64 gigabyte kit, guess what? That's gonna come down because you added in more stress to the memory controller. If you wanna reach, let's say 64 gigabytes, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is like the sweet spot where you could easily get it with two sticks or four sticks of RAM. Yep. And a mm -hmm. lot of people like the aesthetics of having four populators and like yep. you have there on the desk. You've got beautiful RGB of the four sticks. You don't have any teeth missing. And <laughs> um, if, if they wanna reach 64 gigabytes, for example, is it easier? to reach that XMP of X amount, let's say 6,000 MTs with yep. two sticks of RAM, 
all four sticks of RAM. Yeah, so it, it's always going to be still easier with two, right? So the you know what we try to communicate to a lot of people in the community is ultimately going to be that rank, density, and population. Anytime any one of those go up, you're always going to be going down, right? So if your density goes up, your your speed's going to go down. If your population goes up, it goes down, and you can kind of pull those in different scenarios, right? So if your population doesn't go up, but your density uh, goes up, right, it's still going to go down, but it will still scale higher than if it was both rank and uh, excuse me, if it was both um, density and population, right? Which would be, you know, you're going to like. A good example of that would be like 120 gigabytes, right? Which right now you still can only do with a four DIM configuration, right? But yes, uh, to your point, it's always going to be easier in a two DIM configuration, even if it's at a higher density than it would be in a four DIM. Um, now, there is a little bit of motherboard, uh, what's called topology that can influence this. Um, all general kind of most motherboards right now that are produced on the market. Um, you're going to have what's called a daisy chain topology as opposed to a T topology design. And this is again gets back to that trace layout design. Um, one favors a four dim configuration and one favors a two dim configuration. But if you kind of think about what the benefit of DDR5 is, right, is really this impressive level of bandwidth that can be supplied for the memory. It doesn't necessarily make sense to prioritize four dims, right? Because we know that DDR5 can offer so much more bandwidth. And the best way to get to that bandwidth is to do it through two DIMMs. So as a motherboard manufacturer, and actually really, this is not just ASUS, all motherboard manufacturers, we are prioritizing a two, uh, essentially kind of a two DIMM design, even on four DIMM motherboards, because that's what allows us to get the better scaling, right? Um, and you will still see a difference between like a two DIMM board and a four DIMM board. So um, if you took like a current, uh, like this is an extreme board or hero board, but it doesn't really matter. Price price point does affect it a little bit in terms of some elements in terms of the design, but uh, you can do, take for instance, like on Z790, most Z790 uh, ASUS motherboards will be able to comfortably with a good IMC, like I said, 7,000 is the minimum, and many will do about 74 to about 7,600 with two DIMMs. Uh, when you go into then like something like an Apex board, which might only have two slots, because there's what's called less signal interference, it's an optimized topology where it doesn't have to do with those four slots, it only has two slots, you can take that same CPU and probably almost scale that to almost about you know 78 to almost 8,000. So you even still get more margin uh, within that. So if you really, really care about that really high level of scaling, uh, you still have to always account for that silicon variance and that CPU, right? And there's also some silicon variance in boards. Not You could take 10 motherboards and there's gonna be a little bit of variance, but the variance generally between boards able to hit a certain value tends to be not as great as the variance between the memory controllers, right? Between those same set of CPUs. Yeah. Um, you mentioned DIMM capacity or density, and then, um, you know, obviously the amount of sticks you have, but you also mentioned rank, um, yeah. you know, memory rank, which is not often mentioned on specs of the RAM kit. So when you are buying the RAM kit, it's not somewhere in the front there you might be finding it somewhere in the you know fine print but is this something that people need to understand especially creators shopping for ram do they need to know what's the rank of the dim sticks they're buying yeah 100 percent. because again if we go back to that poor table um so we go again back to either the intel or the amd it doesn't matter whether uh, we take a look at amds or intels again there but that configuration right there when you see that two by one rank that's when you have your greatest speed. The moment you've noticed, even if you uh, if you you change your rank there, right? Um, so four by one still would give you then 36, and four by two rank you can see goes down to 36, right? And then uh, if I bring over that Intel poor table, uh, you can see how in the prior generation, right? It was also similar that even if you were keeping one rank, but you were changing kind of slots per channel, right? You were dropping. Uh, you're, you're dropping down, right? So it is important definitely to keep in rank. Rank is probably the most immediate way for performance to drop down even more than a density. Um, but they're not always together, but generally they're together. So generally the more dense the memory, you increase the likelihood of going to a higher rank in terms of your memory. Um, it's kind of hard because some people would go like, how can I look at it? Well, a lot of times you can't see the memory module because it's underneath the heatsink. And some people would think, oh, if there's like uh, chips that are on both sides, 
it's going to be dual rank and that's not correct you can actually have chips that are on both sides and it still can be signal rank so really the only good way to do it is you have to actually um, get the information from the manufacturer you got to look in the specs and find out is it a single rank kit or it is a dual rank or it could even be potentially a, a quad rank kit but that would be um like i said pretty rare unless it was like a really really high density kit. this was 12th gen that you just showed us yeah. but when we come to 13th gen um i believe that there is whether you're single or dual rank it's still 5600 mts right actually i don't uh, believe that for dual rank um not for 5600 for 5600 it should it should be only for single rank configurations but this is kind of the strength that um, Intel has uh, in terms of their memory controller and the memory code and then also working with a good, um, like I said, board and firmware is that you can always massage essentially how much you're able to kind of tune out of the performance, right? Um, and, and how much margin exists there. Like I said, it's already quite impressive that in both generations, whether it was from that 4800 or on now on Raptor Lake, right, 13th gen 56, that literally you're, you're having, you know, the ability to be talking about that you can run speeds you know of uh, 66 72 7600 speeds that's that's we've never in the history of memory seen that type of scaling within uh, memory generations it's it has never happened before um so it's really really impressive but at the same time that's the balancing act right the speeds have literally gone so fast just for reference keep in mind right right now we hold the the world record for ddr memory overclocking it's over 10,000 mt we this has been achieved in an ultra short period of time. You literally didn't even double. You went over double what the initial introduction was for memory speed on the on the standard, right? In a really compressed amount of time. It's exciting because as enthusiasts, this means tons and tons of bandwidth is being given to you, right? Um, but then the challenge comes in is that you're talking about these extremities and, and what ultimately uh, is going to affect your stability when you're trying to get to some of these extremities. Could you simply explain what is single rank and what is dual rank? RAM, if you, if you see one, sometimes even it's the same RAM uh, provider or make that provides you single and dual rank. So what, what does it mean? What is single and dual uh, rank? Yeah, RAM? so it, it ha has to do with essentially the bits uh, that are on uh, the memory itself, right? And so again, there's no easy way for the user to know this information, um, but essentially it, it has to, like I said, do with the amount of addressing that is happening, right? And so when you're increasing the ranks, it's how the information is being accessed. And so the more ranks that you have, the more simultaneous access to those bits. Um, it's again, maybe think about it like being in a, um, an environment where you had multiple people talking right at the same exact time um, if I had maybe one person there pretty easy like me and you right we can have a clean easy conversation even if probably both of us are not talking at the same time but the moment we probably brought in somebody else into this conversation and you have them start to talking at the same time guess what your brain starts to probably get a little bit like wait what did he say and what did she say I'm getting it just it's getting a little bit more complicated for me to understand this whole conversation um, and so that's probably the easiest way to it to address it but uh, again probably the best way for users just to try to find out whether it affects them is going to be checking you know uh, with the memory manufacturer and see if it lists that information for the most part though um, rank isn't going to be as critical as density because still a lot of what you're seeing out there is going to be um, single rank memory. So it's it's not like, you know, you have to be super, super concerned about this. It's more generally the challenge of, like I said, also the, the population and the density being a factor. So again, even if you got four dims and they were all single rank, right? Uh, but you were increasing that density or increasing that population, you're still going to be bringing down your scaling. So remember, doesn't matter whether you talk about rank, whether you talk about density or whether you talk about population. Anytime you bring up one of those three, your scaling is, is going to be coming down. Is there a difference between AMD and Intel CPU memory controllers? You mentioned that already that one has maybe like AMD is just the new dog in the game and it's the first generation of DDR5 memory controllers. Intel with their 13th gen is newer, you know, second generation. Yeah. Is there anything else that's different between those memory controllers? There is, uh, and it gets kind of tricky because it depends on how you want to do performance tuning. Um, so, you know, with AMD, you have something that's called the Infinity Fabric and uh, kind of how that works in relation to feeding memory from the CPU. Um, you know, in the past, you I generally wanted to have kind of this what's called one-to-one 
um, kind of value. So you want to try to kind of match the memory to be able to running at a certain gear or certain value in relation to kind of what you had in terms of your infinity fabric. Intel actually also has something that's similar to this. Uh, it's called the gear ratio. And generally you have kind of a gear one or gear two, but DDR2 pretty much is always running in a gear two speed. I think for most users though, these, these things don't really play a part. Um, I think the way that most users are ultimately purchasing their memory they're ultimately just trying to figure out what are the effective kind of ranges that I can consider when I'm looking at one platform at the other, right? And so I think when you're looking at AMD, um, again, remember their baseline is 5600. Anything over that is an overclock and it's not guaranteed, right? Like I said, out of that 10 CPU samples, you could have uh, some CPUs that wouldn't even be able to hit maybe 6000 MT. So you would have to go down to a slower speed. And I can show you actually how you do that. It's called DRAM divider testing, right? When you want to maybe actually test your, your scaling. Um, speeds over that are going to be possible on AMD but they won't be as consistently possible as they are going to be on Intel. Uh, as I noted right now on 13th gen, the really the baseline uh, for the vast majority of CPUs is going to be 7000 MT plus. So I say that quite conservatively that about, you know, 80% of CPUs are going to be able to do 7000 MT and it's not uncommon for them to be in the 72, 74 to even up to about 7600 range. And that would even be on a uh, four dim motherboard, not even a two dim based motherboard. You don't generally see these type of memory speeds on the uh, AMD platform. Uh, AMD platform, you're generally going to be targeting a lower uh, value in terms of that speed. But it kind of works out, right? Because the, the sweet spot right now in terms of memory density and, and speed in the market is, I would say, 6,000 to about 6,400. And uh, then depending on your timings, that's kind of the sweet spot. The, the, then the higher the speed or the higher density, you start to get into more expensive kits. And definitely if you're, if you somebody that's super performance minded, then, you know, uh, it's, it might be worth, you know, uh, allocating more of your budget for that. But you kind of can see that for both platforms, the memory that is most commonly being considered uh, would generally be able to work on both of them. Why are some RAM kits uh, and why some RAM kits have better XMP stability than others. So you mentioned oh, that. This is that, wow. This is a really, really good question. Um, so, so go on. Yeah. So uh, different manufacturers might kind of like phrase this uh, a little bit differently, um, but you kind of have to think about it that again, you're talking about an overclock profile, right? And that profile uh, has to be defined and you kind of, it can be quite tricky for them to define that profile and have it work for a lar the largest amount of CPUs and even the largest amount of motherboards. Um, because some motherboards might have maybe have like a six layer PCB, some motherboards might have like a 10 layer PCB, some motherboards might have maybe more uh, optimized uh, firmware code, right, for your memory management. There could be a lot of kind of discrepancies. And this, this doesn't necessarily mean that the XMP profile is the end or, or be all best option. In some situations, um, it should be kind of more of like this kind of base starting value essentially. And you may have to potentially maybe add a little bit of voltage or you might have to adjust the timing to actually have it become stable on your system. And this kind of goes against the grain a little bit of what people think about XMP where by default they think, should always be that I can just drop it in and have it work. So it can be quite tricky uh, for the memory manufacturer's perspective because you have to account uh, for essentially that memory has to work on potentially hundreds of different motherboard configurations. And so there's some that might be a little bit better. There's some that might be quite a bit better and there's some that might be a little bit worse. So you kind of almost have to tune kind of for the lowest common denominator. And so some memory manufacturers might decide to maybe be a little bit more aggressive on their profile than others, right? Um, to maybe give you a little bit better performance. Some uh, memory manufacturers might have a 10 layer PCB design versus an eight layer PCB design. And that actually means that the signal integrity will be a little bit more uh, tight and actually a little bit cleaner. And that can actually provide a little bit higher level of stability at certain values. So it, it can be kind of a uh, tricky uh, in terms of that. And there's also some information that is important to understand. If you check certain manufacturers' websites, they will even detail to you the information that we're talking about here. It's not always apparent on the page, but there will be a portion on the page that you'll be able to bring up and it might show you that, hey, uh, this XMP profile is dependent on the quality of the CPU and motherboard combination. And what they're pretty much telling you there is saying is that even though this kit is rated for this speed, it can't necessarily be guaranteed to run at this speed 
because of some of those factors that we talked about, right? Um, but uh, the last point that I think I would make there in terms of that XMP uh, profiling is just because you can't hit the XMP profiling doesn't mean that the XMP profile doesn't have value. Um, it has been pre-screened by that memory manufacturer to be able to at least know that it is able to run at or around that speed with that similar kind of voltage and that similar set of timings. And that still does have value because otherwise, if you didn't have that information, um, you would have to do it all manually, right? You'd have to be buying a kit and you'd have to go, okay, if I don't know how to set the divider speed, if I don't know how to set my timings, if I don't know how to set my voltage, you'd have to know how to go in there and dial in all those values. You mentioned about massaging the memory with a bit of more voltage and uh, less voltage sometimes. I know this is a little bit more like overclocking side for people who are more enthusiasts and are probably not for creators, but I think uh, still interesting to understand what does it mean? You mentioned that some of the uh, IC manufacturers, there are three main ones, uh, Samsung, Micron and SK Hynix. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us like what's the difference between these because actually we don't see a lot of uh, these RAM providers out there because there's there's not like a Samsung mainstream you know XMP RAM right. kit right yeah. we have Corsair yeah. we have G Skill we have all sorts of uh, you know Kingston all these yeah, different when, manufacturers. Whenever you're looking at your memory right so you know like yeah so here you know I've got Corsair or right here I might have my G Skill or here I might exactly. have Patriot or, you know, the one right here next to me, Kingston, doesn't matter. That's the way that we think about our memory. And even when we go to the manufacturer's websites, they actually generally will not list the IC provider. Um, and there's a couple of reasons to this. One is the IC providers can actually change depending on sourcing demand, right? So, mm -hmm. or production, right? So sometimes, um, you can actually start with one production of an IC and then it can change into another production of an IC, right? Um, so this has actually happened even with SK Hynix, right? Where they had M die and then they went over to like A die and they start to have different properties. Um, one might be able to scale it to higher frequencies at maybe tighter, vol at lower voltages than the prior generation, um, even within the same uh, company, right? So that was SK to SK, right? Um, and the reason why this is also, again, important is the other big no-no of memory, which is don't try to mix and match modules. Um, so, you know, we I don't think this has been brought up yet, but for one, there is no 4DIM XMP kit. It doesn't exist on the market. You cannot go buy a 4DIM kit. So every for DDR5, time, for DDR5, that is. Yes, for DDR5, correct. Uh, for DDR4, you can definitely buy them. Um, uh, but for DDR5, you can't buy a 4DIM kit. It doesn't exist. So you're always buying essentially two kits of memory, right? And this is where the false presumption kind of comes into play is that people go, there's XMP for four DIMMs, right? Because I can still go into the motherboard, right? Like, so right now, if I went in here and I enabled it, I still see a value. Um, but you have to remember is that that XMP value was defined and validated for that two dim kit. So for that specific ICs, at that specific timings, at that specific voltage. Now, does that mean that it can't potentially work? No, it can potentially work, but there's also things that you don't even see that happen behind the scenes from the motherboard manufacturer that we might have to change other little sub values that actually aren't even part of the XMP profile to get it to work. So we consider this almost like a massaged form of XMP um, because they're having to be kind of adjusted to be able to reach uh, essentially that operating parameter. And this all falls under something that we call auto rules. So for any mother brand manufacturers, they're auto rules. These are auto adjustments that we're doing to attempt to try to streamline or improve upon the experience for you. But it doesn't change all those kind of other factors that we talked about. Um, another tricky part to this conversation too, uh, when you talk about those ICs and kind of where they might kind of benefit it, um, one versus the other, is if we gave like a reference to like Micron. Micron makes outstanding memory, very, very good quality in terms of its stability and reliability, but generally it was lower scaling uh, than you might have saw, uh, seen for let's say Samsung or SK Hynix. So most of uh, Micron's kits were usually like 4,800 to about like 5,600 MT. Um, but you saw Samsung kits definitely doing all the way up to like 6,000. And then you saw SK Hynix being a lot of the memory that was generally in that like 62, 64, 6,600 range. So an example of this is I have um, a kit of memory here. It's actually an A data, it's an XPG kit, and it has two different ICs from two different production points. Now, why would that be important? Well, think about it. If one set of DIMMs were uh, designed and they were tuned with a certain profile and a certain timing range, right? Um, they kind of want to run at a little bit of a different level than another level, right? And so maybe you buy a DIM a year apart, 
and you think it's the same exact dim, it might even be rated by the manufacturer exactly the same, right? But the inherent kind of range or tolerances that it might have can be different. So you could have this one that could be Micron and you could have this one that could be Samsung and you've all of a sudden mixed them, right? Now, if you bring those values down more conservatively, it's probably easier for them to kind of work together. Um, I kind of think about this like like a maybe like a, maybe like a handoff, you know, like in track and field, like in the Olympics, you know, where you got to pass the baton, right? You know, it becomes a really good balancing act of people knowing how to pass the baton. But, you know, a new team that maybe hasn't worked together that well, what happens sometimes is they fumble when they're passing that baton, right? And just the experience, it doesn't work out that well. And that's kind of actually similar to when you mix those kits. If you're mixing maybe one IC with another IC, you're probably not going to get that great of experience. Ideally... If you are going to mix DIMMs, you would want to match the ICs. And uh, we can show this, but we thankfully at least offer in our UEFI, our, our UEFI firmware, uh, we do give you the ability that you can see the actual SPD information and the and the actual vendor. So you can actually know like who who makes my memory. Is it you know is it well you have a memory manufacturer, but who makes the ICs right? Uh, whether mm -hmm. it's Micron, SK Hynix, or Samsung. If we're talking about um, Samsung, SK Hynix, Micron, and so on, you mentioned that there is a bit of uh, dif difference in there. What are some of the differences that you have seen as a motherboard uh, manufacturer? Um, that why and what, what are some of the better ones and what are some of the lower ones? If someone's looking for, look, I can see SK Hynix here, I can see Samsung here, I can see Micron yeah. here. Which one is better? Um, it it can, kind of comes down to depending on, I guess, you know, what your what your goal is, right? Um, Micron, I think, has really been their memory to a very outstanding yield and consistency and quality at their kind of target brand. This allows them to be very, I think, price aggressive, which is like if you go to like Crucial or their website, you can buy that memory. Uh, but they're not necessarily maybe tuning it for a high level of overclocking, um, right? Uh, whereas, let's say, maybe the SK side, uh, they're going like we're tuning it to allow for even greater scaling. So if the memory uh, manufacturer wants to work with us and bin these, so sort these in the f facility, add more voltage, we kind of give you this room that if you're willing to add more voltage, produce more heat, consume more power, right, we can give you even greater scaling, right? Um, so SK Hynix is probably right now the, the, the leader in terms of giving you that fastest speed possible in terms of kind of kits that are available but you can get still like i said very very performant kits of um, micron based memory right um, and very very performant kits of samsung based memory but most of the highest speed kits that you're currently going to see on the market right now and keep in mind if you guys watch this you know a year down from though this changes because different companies are producing different ics right so like i said right now sk hynix is just transitioning from a higher a high performing ic that was called uh, M die now you've, you're going, going to your uh, A die right. Um, this could change again. Samsung could maybe come out with a new revision, and that new revision all of a sudden starts to have really, really great scaling, right? Um, and uh, you know, but for you as a user, you generally don't have to worry about this too much um, because that's the job of kind of the memory manufacturers, them trying to find the best IC to the target that they're trying to uh, provide to you as a user, and that's usually going to be that. That, that MT number along with the timings and then along with the voltage, right? Uh, that's going to be, you know, what influences those kind of uh, three values. Yeah, and I think for viewers, it's important to know that they're most likely the average user who just applies XMP don't really need to worry about the uh, IC providers. And even mm -hmm. if they change, it's still, it's completely fine. This happens in the all over tech industry. Everyone does it. It's not just memory. We yep. see it in uh, SSDs. We see it in mm -hmm. sometimes GPUs. We see it in Apple does it on their iPhones. It happens yep. everywhere. Even yeah. if it, you're- it's just part of, uh, supply, Yeah, it's a part of supply chain management, right? It can be, uh, you know, for a lot of different reasons. Maybe you go to a new production process and you're going to change over. There's going to be a lot of different reasons. So this isn't, like I said, a negative factor. Uh, it's just part of the reality of just you know electronics production right let's say that you um you got yourself the ram kit now and you've you found out that for some reason your ram is not stable right 
why are some of the reasons that your RAM is not stable? And then we're going to talk about some of the tips you have for people to improve or get the stability, perhaps in some of the Asus motherboards, what are some of the tools you have in BIOS? But first of all, what are some of the reasons you might not have the stable XMP? Like in your mind, what's the checklist? We've already like kind of covered different aspects of it already, but just if someone's thinking, look, yeah, my XMP kind of, is not working. Going over. So yeah. uh, the, first, the first one is it could just be that you have reached kind of the um i'd say that that's scaling for the cpu right and so remember if we talked about like out of 10 cpus you know um 10 of those cpus would be able to hit like 6000 mt or now like 7000 mt it could just be one you're at that little bit of a more of a margin so you're just kind of pushing the limit right um and that also would translate into the density right maybe it's a little bit too high of a density and also at that speed and that's important that when you make that kind of memory purchase you kind of have to be prepared that you've been, you either have a higher probability of success or a lower probability of success right it would be great to see that when you go to the memory manufacturer's uh, page or you go to you know your e-tailer to kind of know is this what's the kind of the realm of likelihood of success right but that's kind of what you have to think about um as far as really being kind of the determining factor right um and this also so assumes that you're uh, running even two dims, right? Because the moment if you did four dims, we know that that is already going to be much more difficult than it was re uh, running, um, to, excuse me, um, four versus two, right? Um, now, are there some things that could potentially also be holding you back? Sure. Uh, maybe one of them could be that uh, the voltage is maybe a little bit too low. Um, so that could mean maybe, hey, I have to increase the voltage a little bit uh, for the memory controller itself, right? But most of the times, you also have to balance out the fact that if you're going to be increasing voltages, you're also going to be um, adding more power consumption, you're going to be producing more heat, right? Um, and even potentially adding more degradation uh, to your CPU, right? Uh, which is not something that you necessarily want to do. So even though you might be able to bump it a little bit more, the question comes in is, should you be bumping a little bit more, right? So that is also something to account for. Um, the other one could be is that the timings, right? Um, keep in mind that depending on how that memory profile was designed, could be maybe some of those timings are maybe a little bit too tight. And so maybe they might have to just be adjusted a little bit, um, right? And that means, so let's say maybe I bought a kit of like, uh, you know, again, it's like a GSCO kit, it could be like a C28 kit. Well, maybe that, I'm gonna have to tighten that, excuse me, instead of having to be so tight, maybe I have to loosen it up just a little bit, and maybe go to like C30, maybe C32 versus C28, um, right? Um, so that could be something that could be also influencing it. But in most situations, um, it's generally going to be, like I said, a limiting factor there between either the, the margin that you have between the CPU, so the IMC, or the margin that you might have also on the motherboard side, because that, that can exist a little bit um, in terms of that. Uh, and then the last one would be the density, right? Where it's just, you know, whether it's the density is achieved by four DIMMs or whether it's just because you went with 64 versus a 32 gigabyte kit. I'm thinking from a creator's point of view, perhaps maybe someone who's not just already built their system, but they already have their parts list, right? And they want to make sure that look, I want to make sure that my memory is actually stable and my system runs stable. So I'd say you probably, probably look at the CPU, you look at your memory controller of the CPU, then you look at the QVL list. Could you explain what is a QVL list of yeah. a memory? So yeah, so the QVL list is kind of, again, it's a really tricky one because I see a lot of people, they always make this recommendation that they're like, oh, just buy memory that's on the QVL and this will assure that it'll run. And actually it doesn't. Uh, and I know people might find that surprising because they're like, but wait, you're the motherboard manufacturer. What do you mean? Isn't the, QV the whole point of the QVL? No, the QVL you want to think about it is almost like a proof of concept, but it's not just, it's, it's, it is a real proof of concept because we actually have to run it at that speed. The difference though is again, if we take what are the three things that at least on the highest level influence memory speed, it's the CPU, the kit of memory, right? And the motherboard, right? Well, on the QVL, what could we 100% guarantee? We can guarantee that kit and we can generally pretty be pretty consistent by consisting the motherboard, but we can't confirm or control the quality of that CPU, which is what you have as a user and you're putting in, right? And so this is where a lot of users get tripped up because they're like, QVL says it, my motherboard says this on the spec page that it can support this, right? And I know in general, just Intel supports this CPU frequency, so why can't I get there? Well, guess what? That IMC, which has variants, that's the part that you can't. So that's the part that you kind of always just have to account for. And that's why, um, you know, we, we at least do, you know, like I try to put out there in the community, we try to put out these overclocking insights or kind of guides or message points to say, hey, you know, 
if you're picking your memory, uh, like now for like 13th gen, I'll tell most people, hey, if you go up to 7,000 with a 32 gigabyte kit of memory, you've got about an 80% likelihood of success. The moment you jumped into like 74 or 76 or 78, guess what? That percentage starts coming down, right? So you have to be prepared for a higher likelihood that even though on paper, right? And even to a degree, validation from the QVL, right? The qualified vendors list, they should work. There's still some variance within that. And that's going to bring down that probability of success. A lot of the motherboards support different generations of CPUs, which also have different memory controllers of generations as well, right? So yeah, for like Z690 could be an example of that where, you know, Z690, you were able to put like 12th gen or 13th gen and also vice versa. You could run a 12th gen and a Z790 based motherboard, right? And this will also happen for AM5 at some point when even newer AM5 CPUs come out and you can run that like on X670 or like B650 or something like that. Um, and there is a difference because some people go like, Z690, is there any difference between Z790? And there actually is. Um, we were able to like from generation to generation improve what's called signal reflection, which is again, it's just saying that the overall noise, um, when anything is electrically talking to each other, there's noise that gets generated and we were able to tighten that up, make it a little bit finer. And so an example of this is uh, Z790 on average, like from, bo from board to board, even with like the same CPU, you'll generally get a little bit more margin within Z790 than you would with in Z690. Uh, but Z690 difference is with a 13 gen part in there, I can still run 7000 MT, right? But I have to bring along that um, 13th gen because that IMC is what's really driving a large part of that. Uh, the board imparts a part to it, right? But if I would have put 12th gen in there, maybe the most that I might have seen out of it might have been, you know, 60, 62 or 6400, right? Uh, but the moment that I put in that 13th gen, I'd be able to get in there. But then maybe I take that same 13th gen and I put it on Z790, and now maybe that peak number might all of a sudden maybe be closer to like 72, 74, 7600. So you can see that on average, um, I would say it's somewhere between about like 200 to about like 400 plus megahertz bump um, between Z690 and Z790. That's very, very interesting. Cause I was going to ask you, let's say if we have a mother, how much does the motherboard actually affect the memory speeds as well? Let's say we have a, um, 5,600 MTs kit, which is quite, you know, conservative. If we took like a 13700K and i7, um, a Z790 motherboard, Z690 motherboard, B660, uh, yep. B760, for example, maybe had some H670, for example, or something like that, because yep. some of the motherboards are lower end motherboards. Intel has locked or motherboards have, have been locked XMP. So XMP doesn't work from them. But let's say all the ones that XMP is allowed on yep. one of them. Um, is there how much of a difference there is? Because some of the people think, look, I'm going to save a bit of cash, go with the B660 motherboard yep. and, mm -hmm. you know, 13700K, for example. Does that affect as much of the um, XMP. Yeah, so definitely for most most situations, generally you wouldn't usually run DDR5 in gear one. You you know DDR uh, DDR4 on Z on Z series chipsets you could definitely consider running in gear one. But um, when we talk about kind of the board influencing it, um, whether you're talking about kind of more entry level boards, so like take for instance us, we've got like you know our Prime Dash A right versus something like here I've got the Extreme right. It's a big price band delta right. As, you know like here you might be talking about like you know, $250, $299 motherboard versus like a $1,000 plus motherboard, right? How much of the difference are you going to see? Because sometimes people say overclocking is better. Not that much, really. Uh, the, you know, I was actually like in the prior generation, I showed, hey, from the prime motherboard all the way to the sideboard, all of them could do, you know, 6,000 MT or all of them were able to do 7,000 MT. So really, there's not that much. Where there is a little bit of influence that does occur is that higher end boards that will have a higher what's called layer count, right? Um, maybe going uh, to, like I said, like eight layer or like a 10 layer motherboard. Uh, because essentially when you have more layers, you can more optimally route the signal paths to have less noise and overall just a, a, a better type of transmission experience. Um, that can give you a little bit of a margin or a little bit more of an edge in terms of stability, especially at higher values. But to your point, like in those lower values, if we're talking about like 5,600, you know, um, 6,000 MT, 62, 64, it's not really that much. Um, it can improve it, right? So you will have higher success rate 
on that, but it's not a large degree. The CPU was still much more of an influencing factor there. So the quality of that CPU uh, is always going to be a much higher determiner of the overall quality of the experience you're going to have. So if you took that really good CPU and you put it into a 10 layer motherboard versus you know, an eight layer motherboard versus like a six layer motherboard, it just keeps getting better because that CPU is still that big one, right? Um, those just help to kind of give you a little bit more margin, but that's the main part. And if somebody does want to save money and they want to go with like a B series chipset, right? So like B760 just, you know, came out the beginning of the year, that's fine. You can still get very, very good uh, DDR5 uh, overclocking experience on there. Um, as always though, do keep in mind, uh, it gets forgotten about because people kind of, I think, understand it for CPU. Uh, but they forget about it for DRAM, and this is, you know, Intel and AMD, right? Technically, uh, DRAM overclocking is also voiding your warranty. Uh, so you do have to be mindful of, um, you know, uh, that balancing act, right, of performance to everything. And, and this gets kind of confusing because you buy the, the XMP kit and it's like it's all validated and that has a warranty and your motherboard has a warranty. But remember, your CPU also has a warranty and there are guidelines that are noted uh, for the CPU resident to those guidelines. Tell me more about that, because last time we had this conversation, there was a bit of a difference between AMD CPU warranty and Intel CPU warranty. Uh, I'm not sure if that has changed because um, in terms of like the overclocking and that as well. I think for creators, I've always told creators, look, overclocking is not worth it for you if you use this as a tool. The stability and CPU degradation and all of that is just not worth it. So I don't think this is for this, but I think I have a few listeners as well who are a lot of, you know, very, very high end PC enthusiasts. So when we're talking about the warranty of CPU, AMD and Intel, what have you found um, some of the things? So that one's, a, you know, I got to give a little bit of a you know, a, let's say a PR type of message here uh, where I tell you is that you'd have to defer to check the guideline notes that are uh, denoted by both Intel and AMD on how they warrant their CPU. Um, you can at least though confirm some of these points of values. An example is if we take for instance here um, and we take a look at, you know, AMD's Expo based page, right? Um, so the Expo is kind of the preferred kit. You can actually see right here that it notes you, um, it is underneath footnotes. So here you'll see kind of information regarding AMD Expo, uh, but you can go into the footnotes and it says overclocking and or undervolting, which is also something people do right in CPUs, uh, AMD processors and memory, including without limitation, altering clock frequencies, multipliers and memory timing voltage to operate outside of AMD's public specifications will void any applicable AMD product warranty. This, something that you have to be mindful of. If you have more specific questions, of course, we are not uh, Intel or AMD, uh, we would recommend. Um, on the motherboard side, it doesn't affect our warranty because the motherboard has been designed with that in kind of mind. So if you did want to engage, it doesn't affect us. But if you kind of want to be cognizant of all of the spectrums of what you have per warranty per device, it is something that you do have to account for, right? And this is important because there are some memory kits. A lot of the memory kits you purchase are going to be XMP kits. So inherently by engaging that, you are gonna be potentially engaging in that overclocking. Even though you might not think it's overclocking, it is overclocking. Um, so if you want to run like pure stock standard, then you actually have to buy a kit that is not an XMP kit. It's a kit that's designed to actually run at what is called the JDEX spec, right? Um, and there are partners that do, do produce these kits like uh, Crucial. Uh, I don't know how, um, you know, where you may be in the part of the world, but hey, for instance, if you go to them, they actually have just pure JDEC kits. And the great thing is that they'll run at that JDEC value. There's no, you know, worries or concerns in that. And this really only happens in the PC DIY realm, because if you were to buy like a system, you buy like a laptop, they're all pre-validated to run within essentially these factory standards, right? It's really only you get into this whole conversation in the DIY arena where so many things can be selected by the user, right? But uh, if you run an XMP RAM without the XMP, because obviously XMP does not come enabled by default yep. on the motherboard, then that is not overclocking, right? Correct, yes. So you could run an XMP kit on a motherboard, not engage it. The only disadvantage of that though, is that it depends on how the profile is set for that memory to run essentially at its default setting. So an example of this is a lot of XMP kits that exist out there, they might actually run um, at a much lower speed than let's say a uh, native JDEC kit of memory would. So an example is again, if like I had like this 6,000 kit, 
and I put it in on my motherboard, it might post and default to let's say like 4,800, right? It wouldn't, it would, might not default to like 5,600. So it would be under the spec or speed that I would actually want. Where if I got, let's say a actual validated JDEC kit that wasn't XMP, it would actually default to like 56. Does that make sense? So there, you could be in this kind of little bit weird scenario where, um, you know, how do you make sure that you're getting exactly the right speed, right? That's designed for your memory. Um, is there a memory controller difference between i5, i7, i9, Ryzen 5, Ryzen, Ryzen 9? Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the specs, they all have the same, same memory, uh, memory, spec. Contr yeah. memory spec. I know if you, if you go, uh, let's say i5 uh, 12 uh, 13400 or when you go before um under the k basically if it's not a k then it sometimes has a different uh, value of the memory controller as well that's what i found on the, looking at the specs but is there a difference between the memory controller like i5 13600k versus 13900k that one's a little bit trickier generally just because of the way that the kind of the production process works um you generally do find that usually the best memory controllers will be on the higher end CPU sides of the fence. But for again, the majority of the target, what the consumer is targeting, whether they're buying again, like a 7600X versus like a 7900X or uh, you know, a 13400 versus like a 13700 or a 13900, you generally would be seeing very similar scaling. You shouldn't generally see that large of a delineation. Um, but like I said, there is always gonna be CPU to CPU variants, right? So you always have to kind of think about it that um, more so for maybe kind of jumping from one uh, product segment to another. So I5 to I7 to I9, take for instance, right? It's always more important to kind of think about it that if you had 10 of that same exact CPU, so I had 10 13600Ks, or if I had 10 3400s, right? Uh, 13400s, that there is going to still be, exist variance between any single one of those. So I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind is that um, overall scaling is, is quite good um, in that generation. That's the more important part to kind of account for, right? Is that like 13th gen has a better or let's say higher speed memory controller than 12th gen series CPUs, right? And that generally holds true regardless of what 13th gen series CPU you look at. Um, but you still have to always account for that regardless of that 13th gen, if I had multiples of them, some would be a little bit greater in terms of their ability to scale and some would be a little bit less and some would be kind of right there in that average. I'd like to go into a BIOS and have a look at a little bit some of the tools that ASUS provides to actually sure. give you um, you know, stable XMP. And I'd like to kind of enter the this from very, very beginner point of view. Like, how do you turn on XMP? Where do you see your IC provider? What are some of the things that you can see in BIOS that tells you something about the XMP and RAM that you're running? Yeah, uh, let me go ahead and uh, get my little setup here. I'm gonna twist over my keyboard. So um, here, I'm just gonna essentially reboot into the UEFI. Um, you can do it actually a couple of different ways. Um, you know, a lot of people just say spam the delete key um, and that works. Actually, I like doing it in Windows, actually going through the advanced uh, option. The advanced option in Windows, it actually allows you to go ahead and get into the UEFI without having to spam anything. So it's great because I can engage it and then just literally if I was to walk away, I'd come back and it would be in the UEFI. So I always prefer to do it that way, but this is kind of the way that everybody will tell you to do it. It works, um, but you know there are better ways, uh, at least if you wanna try the advanced command prompt option or like I said, the advanced startup options, it works well. Um, but with that, We've gone ahead and entered into the UEFI. Um, now, depending on your board, uh, every manufacturer is going to be different. This is ASUS, right? So we, of course, really have, I think, a great UEFI. Some people may see, depending on their motherboard, um, what is referred to as kind of the easy mode interface. So if I was to start off here, that's what it would look like is your easy mode interface. You can always clearly see your information over here. So it'll show you the actual amount of memory that you have installed, so the density. So we can see that we've got 64 gigabytes. Um, some people get confused by this because they're like, I see this value and then I see this value. And actually what this tells you is that the 4000 is just actually what it's running at. So it's running at 4000 MT, but it tells you actually right here that the base profile that could be supported actually is 48. But then there's also the XMP profile. Um, we'll see directly below that the actual dim slots. So that tells us which slots are populated, uh, A1, A2, B1, B2. For reference, if you're first putting a system or you just want to confirm that you've done something right, 
your primary banks are pretty much always going to be A2 and B2. Yeah, you do not want to put things next to each other. It actually would be in opposing banks. So again, A2 and B2. And then right below that under XMP, we could see if we wanted to engage it, we would literally just go and we would click over and we would have it enabled. And you could see right there, it would enable our profile. Um, now, that's great under the easy mode. There are a couple of little bit more options that you have once you go into the advanced mode. So if I go into the advanced mode interface, let me go ahead and actually just redefault this again here. So I'm just gonna do F5. F5 is just gonna kind of reset the board back over to defaults. And uh, let me go ahead and back in here in the advanced mode. Sorry, I just needed to see where I was there. So for us under the advanced, uh, the default uh, kind of option you would be looking at would be under extreme tweaker and then AI uh, overclock tuner. And you'll see that you have a couple of different options. Now manual is how you would actually overclock your memory if you didn't have an XMP profile. That means that you would have to kind of know all the things on how to kind of tune your memory. So I'd have to go, okay, I have to pick my memory divider and then I would actually have to define timings and I would have to define uh, the voltage. So I'd have to go over here into terms of timings. And I have to set all these timings and same thing. I'd have to go down here to my voltage and I'd have to change that. But the great thing is with an XMP kit, that's what the memory manufacturer's done for you is that they've essentially pre-screened the memory and they've kind of tried to target a value that they feel pretty confident is gonna work and you can select it. Now on ASUS, you will see that there's um, different XMP profiles. You can see right here, we have an XMP profile one and an XMP profile two. Some people go, it's like, what's the right one to use? Technically, there's no right one to use. Um, it can, we just give the option because it can improve the likelihood of potentially getting you to have a higher degree of a stability or even better performance. Um, an example of this is um, XMP2 is actually what is considered our pure default. So this is exactly reading the information just as it's provided by the DRAM manufacturer. So if you want to try something, XMP2 is not, a, is not a bad place to start because it's like the most pure basic form of XMP. Is that always like this? That XMP2 is like the base good um, like place to start or like the most stock? Because sometimes it's XMP1 because it's a bit confusing because you think XMP1 would be kind of the first priority. Yeah, yeah. But actually XMP2 is the is the most like what the mam uh, the RAM kit comes with say, look, this is the XMP profile, right? It's the most kind of pure stock profile. So yes, XMP2 yeah. is always gonna be kind of that most pure stock profile option. Um, XMP1 is what we refer to kind of as like an ASUS specific profile. And you might go, well, why does ASUS have a specific profile? Well, if you remember kind of all the part of the conversation that we had, uh, a key thing to understand is that we understand our motherboard design better than, than everybody else, right? Because we designed the motherboard. We designed, we've coded the firmware, we created the motherboard topology. And so sometimes we actually might have more tuned sub values that might be in there to allow us to maximize the compatibility or even the performance. Um, so you can attempt to load in XMP1. Um, so those are your kind of your two options that you have available. Now, technically there is a third option that you also have available. Um, and I would actually have to drop in another kit and I'll do that in a moment so you can see, but we actually have another one that's called XMP Tweaked. And XMP Tweaked is a specialized set that depending on a kit of memory that you have installed, that we've even done further work to, we realize that there's even more kind of tweaking or optimization that can happen to that specific kit of memory to allow it to even have better performance. And so we will give you a, another value. So instead of just seeing XMP1 or XMP2, um, we can actually do XMP tweet. Actually, I think I have a screenshot, so I don't need to swap out the kit. I think I can show you uh, via a screenshot. But those are essentially your XMP options. Um, after you've done that, you're pretty much set. And then you would just, you know, uh, you would go to uh, exit or hit F10 and you would save and exit. So if I understand that correctly, ASUS, if you have a certain type of RAM kit, ASUS motherboard mm -hmm. will understand that there's more potential in the RAM and they'll give you even better, either faster timings or faster frequency or something like that with the uh, XMP tweaked. Correct, yes. And so the, the goal there essentially is that we realize that some actually kits of memory um, do give you the ability to essentially have better performance. Um, so let me see, I think I have the screenshot here. So give me one moment and um, see if I can bring this up right here. So this is what it would look like if you uh, saw it on essentially a board where you installed the memory. And generally you would only see XMP tweaked here under a two DIM configuration. You wouldn't see this under a four DIM configuration because generally, again, 
four dim kits don't exist right so two dims are generally going to be the optimal configuration but you can see right here how it says xmp1 xmp2 and now you see an xmp tweaked so that xmp tweaked would be essentially that other option that you have available so this would even be i would say like maybe the best option if you wanted to engage one for let's say again best performance you've decided that you want to overclock the memory and you see that as an option you could go with that but uh, my general kind of rule of thought though is always when engaging memory and doing kind of overclocking as i go first always what's going to be the highest level of stability and assured success so i do usually default to two and then help people test your memory. And that's the other kind of cool part that we do have within the UEFI that I can uh, show you here. So if I- Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the memory testing. If people are getting like their memory stake, right? They load their XMP on and they want to know, look, is this even stable? Like, yeah. is my CPU able to support this? If my, you know, how, what, what's some of the tools uh, ASUS gives? So uh, a cool option that we have is right here. You'll actually see that there's a mem test option built straight into the UEFI. So this is not going to be on every single one of our boards, but it is on a large number of our motherboards. And we do list it on the product page. So you can always confirm that if you're interested in knowing this. Now, if you don't and you are, uh, you know, maybe running on also another board, mother, another motherboard manufacturer, you can get a bootable memory test. Um, so you can get a utility to do this, but we just streamline the experience for you by building it straight into the UEFI. So right there, you could literally just click yes, and it will reboot into the UEFI environment and it will allow you to go ahead and test the memory. So this is great because um, again, if you remember kind of in the very beginning of our conversation, I talked about that there's three ways to assess memory, right? You have the post, that is your power on self test, right? And so the power on self test is the first part. So an example to the power on self test, if I uh, just get out here, um, that's when we first kind of start our system, that's your power on self test. So your memory has to be able to pass literally just going through that initial power on self test. The next part is the boot. The boot is when it boots into Windows. Now it could crash during the boot stage. And the last st stability test is actually stability underneath your OS environment actually being used. So you have to actually ideally pass all three forms to have memory be stable. So you need and to pass- And this is the third part, right? Yeah, so the, the third part would be actually going into the Windows environment and then being able to run your memory, right? So again, three things have to occur. You have to be able to, um, you have to be able to post, you have to be able to boot, and then you have to be able to pass within Windows. Now, once you're inside Windows, there are different options. Uh, one option is like if you're using um, an Intel platform, you can use XTU, X, uh, that's Windows uh, a utility provided by Intel, which is free. That will allow you to run a memory test. I like an application that you can get for free or you can pay a small amount to essentially support the creator. It's called OCCT. It's a fantastic memory test that you can run um, to check system stability. And there are a couple of other applications that exist out there as well to assess systems, uh, system memory. Um, but you wanna run that once you essentially get into the Windows environment. So I'm um, sorry. So I'm back in here. Um, and if you then wanted to kind of check your memory, right at that point. Uh, the easiest way to check it is actually in the task manager. Even if you don't install a utility, um, you can just literally open up your task manager and go there and you would be able to check your speed. Now I, I reloaded back the defaults. Um, so uh, it's now at a lower value, but if it was 6,000 MT, you would see 6,000. If you know, it's 48, whatever, you would see that corresponding value. But you can also, again, you can use utilities from different vendors. Um, our Armory Crate utility will actually show you uh, information. XTU can show you information. CPU-Z can show you the information. Just one thing I will show here for a CPU-Z though, is keep in mind that for that memory, um, it, you still have to do a little bit of math if you're gonna use CPU-Z. So a lot of people use CPU-Z and they'll make, make a recommendation, but I think Task Manager is more immediate because it actually gives you the correct value. Mm -hmm. If we go here on CPU-Z and we go to memory, you're gonna see 2000, which will show, which will be confusing to a lot of people. Cause it'd be like, wait, 2000, that's less than four. Remember you have to multiply cause it's DDR. So you would have to multiply that times two and that would let you know that you're writing uh, 4,000, right? Yeah, did you mean DDR5? Excuse me, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I said DDR just in general, right? Because yeah. if you had DDR4 memory, you would still have to do the multiplier. And if you had DDR5, you'd also still have to do it. So it yeah, doesn't matter. But I do think this is, the CPU uh, Z is still important because I've had instances where a uh, task manager just can't read it or reads a random number of memory. Sure, yep sometimes even laptops because laptops memory sometimes is integrated and stuff so task manager doesn't 
quite know what to read, but ZPU-Z, you can easily read the right frequency there. So that's a good tool. Could you show us more about the memory tester there? So let's say we've, we've got into the BIOS, we've hit the XMP on, we've got XMP2 uh, on, it's the most default one or the best one, right? Uh, yep. And then we've pressed save, we've got into the windows, and now we're going back to the BIOS to test the RAM, or is this the right order? Just yeah, so you, you uh, actually, ideally, if you ran through that mem test, the mem test will usually have a default that it will run. Usually, uh, I think it's set, set to uh, four passes. So it actually will come up to you with the entire green screen that would tell you it actually passed. Um, depending on the amount of memory that you have, that could either take shorter or longer. Um, I would say on average, probably going to be maybe about like 30 minutes or something in that range. Um, so once that's passed, then you would want to go into Windows. And at that point, you should feel pretty confident. Um, but mem test i'd say it's not a hundred percent a validator in terms of having the best le uh, level of stability um, but it's a good indicator of generally system stability um, so if it's passed there i still recommend using uh, maybe a more formalized memory test um, but that you could run again within windows right so that's that's an option that you have but the kind of the hierarchy should be set the memory first go into mem test and then after you mem, mem, mem test boot into Windows, and then run your memory test there. But there are still a couple of other little things that we have here in this UEFI. So a new option that we also introduced, um, and it actually applies to Z690, so retroactively we imported this in too, is we have a lot of automated overclocking technologies, uh, really kind of a leader in this space. And so we've had our AIOC technology but now we actually also have a cool little technology to get you a little bit more information about the memory controller. So if I go here under AI features, again, your board has to support this. So it should see, be one of our AI OC enabled motherboards. You go here, you'll see that there's actually a little uh, value right here that says get M MCSP. So that's memory controller SP. And so the SP uh, essentially is an internal logic number that ASUS has defined for multiple criteria that help to kind of give you a little bit of a determining factor about the relative quality to your, uh, to your CPU. So you can see right here, we have an SP information for my CPU. And now I also have SP information for my memory controller. So we're the only manufacturer that does this. There's a lot of advanced logic that goes into be able to define this information. But essentially, the higher the value, the better the quality that is. Uh, there are multiple factors to it, and it's not an end-all be-all arbiter to it. Um, but in examples, let's say maybe you had an, um, uh, an MCSP, like let's say on 13th gen, that might be like 73, you know, let's say in the 70s, right? You could probably have a CPU that would comfortably be able to do probably like, you know, 7,600 MT, right? So it is a way that we're helping to maybe provide some information that, uh, you don't know too much, but you could put this in and then maybe you could join our group, right? Um, and, you know, ask, hey, what, what what value do you have? What value do you have? And then at least it helps you to kind of know what might what range you kind of might be in as opposed to just arbitrarily trying something. Because you can, of course, try it. You could just set your XMP and see if it crashes and then you would know how good your memory controller is. But if you want to at least get a little bit more information, this is also something uh, that uni ASUS uniquely has. So we have this integrated mem test. We also have this SP. Just about the SP value there, the higher, yeah. the better, correct? Generally, yes. I, I don't want to use this as an end RBR because there's a lot of people that get stuck on SP values um, uh, when they think that it's the only arbiter. You can have some SPs that could be lower and you could still have a better memory controller uh, than maybe somebody else. So it's not, let's say, an, uh, an all-determining attribute, right? It's just one part. And what does the SP stand for? Uh, we don't have a designation. Uh, for it, it's just an internal, internal, uh, it's an internal. Uh, but uh, is is it just ASUS internal? Because I've heard that the, some of the CPUs have that as well. If you know the German overclocker Debauer, he yeah, he, yeah. Was he was doing some videos about like CPUs um, that have very highly binned, you know, and the, the SP value was xx amount or whatever yeah but part of that is because so many we're, we're the number one overclocking brand in the world right um led by so many of the overclocking enthusiasts will use our boards to pre-screen and vet their cpus because uh, as an overclocker right you may test hundreds of cpus right so this is one of the best options for overclockers uh, because they can literally just put in the cpu check it and then put another one put in another one until they keep until they find one that's you know, much better because all of a sudden they might have all these CPUs and they go, wow, this one, this one was 121 
and and all these other ones were like you know 105 111 90 84 right you know whatever you know the value range would be so um we get a lot of people that will share these values in the community but it's not too uh like i said over it just showing you an option here that if you want to try to understand a little bit more right or maybe you know you buy two cpus and you kind of want to see whether maybe one is a little bit better than another um, you can do that because the only other way that you can then test for your memory is to do actually um, what I call DRAM divider testing. So you may have to do this regardless. So let's say you get into a situation where your uh, CPU, um, maybe you load up the XMP, it crashes and things don't work the way that they're intended. Well, what do you do, right? Um, do you just go like, oh, I returned the kit? Not necessarily. Um, it just might mean that you might have to massage it a little bit. So an example of this is... Um, Let's say here, the profile 6000, right, C32. So it's a pretty good kit of memory right here. One, if you, again, wanted to find out more information, you could also go to this little tool right here, the SPD information. And this will actually tell you a lot of great values where you can see right here, it actually tells us this kit, it's SK Hynix, right? It tells us even uh, really great information like the serial number, the part number, the actual production year, all that information. And it actually shows us also right here, each one of the profile points, right? So the JDEC value, the XMP profile, uh, the voltage table, it's all listed in there. And if you guys ever don't know, uh, one really great feature that I also love in our ASUS boards when people have to share information and they take pictures using their cell phones, which, hey, it works, but you can always just stick in a flash drive into our motherboard, hit uh, function and F12, and you can save a screenshot straight to your flash drive. So it's much easier, better way to share sharp and clear screenshots um, than, you know, taking a picture and getting the glare and, and everything like that, right? Um, but if we head back over here, the easiest step you would do is let's say, hey, 6,000 is not stable. So what do I do? Well, just go here to the DRAM frequency divider and drop the divider. So if it wasn't stable at 6,000, go and drop it down. So it might be like, hey, 5,800. And now I'm gonna save, exit, and reboot. Now, this, of course, is not the native value, but you're still benefiting because you've had that higher voltage that's been defined for the memory and those timings. So you're still gonna get the C32, 38, 38, 80. So you're still gonna be carrying over this optimized profile. So you're still getting a benefit from an overclocked kit of memory. It's just that you're running it at a little bit more of a conservative value because maybe your memory controller can't run at that speed, right? Or maybe it's the configuration you're running can't run at that speed. And that's an easy way to test finding what is gonna be stable on your system. And I call this simply just DRAM divider scaling. Right, that's all you're trying to do is you're just trying to find what is gonna be stable. So if you tried one configuration and didn't pass, then just go in and drop the divider. And again, if it wasn't stable there, then you, again, you go back. And eventually at one point, you're gonna find a divider that would allow it to be entirely stable, right? So that's the first easiest test. Uh, there is probably one other last point, which could be you could modify some voltages and I could show that if you want, but that's, I'd say the easiest way to kind of uh, attempt to test something outside of the XMP profiles themselves, right? Where you may have to test both XMP2 or XMP1. And then if XMP1 or XMP2 doesn't work, then you want to try changing your uh, DRAM divider. Most creators probably will leave it at that point and won't start messing up around the, with all the voltages yeah. and the DRAM divider is very simple, right? As far yeah. as just, you know, you changing it is right. Like, hey, you can just drop it a little bit of a bump, all right? And then see if everything works through and just get, get running from there, right? You did mention that um, when you get into the windows, so XMP, you click the profile on, and then you do the mem tests in BIOS, and then go to Windows. What is some of the best memory tests on Windows that you can do? Because I've, in my experience, I have seen that I can get the post, I can put the XMP on, I can get to Windows, but then sometimes programs start crashing, I get uh, BOSDs. Sometimes not even like in the first hours, after like eight hours or a few days later, I get a BOSD and it says it's a memory management controller, blah, 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 something like that. Yep. Um, so what are some of the best tests you can do on Windows? Like last thing, you, I think you mentioned something just to go over that again. Yeah, yeah. So actually, let me let me go ahead and show you right here. Um, actually, this this kit is actually an engineering sample kit and there actually is a faulty bit configuration. So I'm actually, hopefully I can show you actually what it would look like if it, if it got an error. So let me one second here to go into this configuration here. And if I remember correct from this kit configuration that I have, if I set this, 
think it should run on this configuration. If not, I can, I know I can test, I can show it another way for sure. Um, but let me just try this one. I don't remember if on this engineering kit, if this will work. If not, I, I can swap out to another one and I can show you for sure how it would end up doing it. But um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into uh, operating system and I'll show you just kind of two very basic ways that you could actually test the memory. Uh, one, like I said, through XTU and the other one through OCCT. Um, but the main thing is that uh, essentially what both of these utilities are attempting to do is fully load the memory, right? Um, and what you'll generally find is that if you don't test your memory in this way, um, it could be essentially that you're able to post, you're able to boot, you're able to start running applications, but once an actual application sits into data bits or part of the memory that essentially has instability, that's all of a sudden where you get the crash, you get a blue screen, you get a, some type of a kernel issue, right, that, that pops up and lets you know that there's a problem that's present in the system, right? Um, and so here, essentially what we're doing is instead of going through and running applications, we're essentially just immediately placing a load on a large part of the memory, generally at least about 80 to 90% of all that memory. Um, and we're also adding an element of heat heat can influence stability uh, for memory. It's, it's not that critical of an issue. Uh, DDR5, most DDR5 kits on the market all have a little uh, temperature IC that you can actually find out the temperature that they're running at. And if they can get too hot, this can increase the likelihood of instability, which is also a little bit of a factor, I think, especially for creators, because if maybe you're running like an extended render and it's actively sitting in memory for a long period of time, you know, when you first start the render, it could be like at 45 degrees, but then like, uh, four hours in, it could be like at 65 or it could be like 70 degrees. And the uh, temperature can play a part that sometimes if temperature gets to a certain point, it can actually bring down instability. Um, so that is a little bit of a factor, but you don't have to worry. You don't really don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, it's not that much of an issue, but if you are kind of trying to be conscious of your system and airflow and things like that, having good airflow to your system will help to mitigate this concern. But let's see if uh, we are in Windows here. And so um, from there, uh, you can I'll show, I guess, first through here through XDU. You just open open it, go ahead and open up XDU. Ah, so actually, see, that's actually a good indicator right there. XDU actually already gave me the error. So generally, it's already telling me this probably wouldn't happen if you're running a normal memory config. Some applications are written to be a little bit more sensitive, and some are going to be a little bit less sensitive. Let's see if the OCCT will open up here. And here I'm expecting actually this configuration to actually not be stable. So you can see right here um, where it's got the memory right. Um, I've gone ahead and defaulted this uh, from 80 to 90. I prefer 90 just to put a little bit more on there. And all you would do is just go ahead and click this. Again, guys, you can go ahead and uh, download this utility uh, from the vendor. Uh, it's, a, it's a freeware application. I strongly recommend though, do consider um, actually getting the application. Uh, there's a small little, uh, like you can support their Patreon. It's like about like $5 or something like that. Great, great utility to be able to test actually your CPU, your memory, your graphics card, even your power supply. You can do a lot of really good testing within this application. Um, you'll see it gives you that link right there. You would be able to click um, start. And when you go ahead and click start, you'll then be able to go ahead and stress test the memory, right? And so if you have faulty bits, either one, one or two things will happen. Either your system might immediately crash right there, or it might take a little bit of time. And eventually when it finds the memory bits uh, that fail, you'll actually get uh, little red markers that'll start coming up that'll actually let you know that the memory has actually failed, right? So we'll see if it comes up there. I'm going to go ahead and let it let it run for a little bit, and I'll see okay. what's see, um, check it. One of my uh, last questions, I was trying to find this out, but I didn't find this out, uh, was ProArt is like ASUS's top-end creator like kind of lineup. Do you know mm -hmm. if ProArt motherboard also have the MemTest built into the BIOS? Uh, yes, we do have actually MemTest on, not on all ProArt models, because we do have ProArt models in different segments, right? So um, uh, for one, MemTest is only on Intel platforms due to differences mm -hmm. in Intel's memory code and AMD's memory code. Um, there's currently some limitations on the AMD side that doesn't allow us to have the MemTest. So if it's on an AMD ProArt motherboard or even on an ROG motherboard, doesn't matter. There's no MemTest. So it's only on Intel. And then on Intel, it would be on uh, Z series, but not uh, like on B series. I also do have a, a suggestion for ASUS. What should they name the SB? Uh, what would it stand for? It should be called Silicon Pottery Value. 
It's still the Kampateri? Okay, I'll definitely, <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure to pass that over to the team. We'll see if maybe in the next revision, maybe a little update will add in a little uh, information Silicon pottery, tab. Really. Yeah. And when you click on the little information tab, it'll tell you Silicon Pottery. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you look at the member kit, one of the first things you'll see is like the megahertz, you know, like 6,000, yep. 7,000 MTs. But then you see that sometimes the timings number actually gets bigger as well. Now, uh, what's your experience in timing versus megahertz uh, you know actual speed of ram versus timings how does this affect so ultimately um you know the main thing that you're trying to do uh, when you have like a kit of memory is that you're trying to get overall hopefully the the lowest latency possible and so the timings are uh, a byproduct of multiple parts of how the memory operates so one is going to be the bandwidth right that the memory operates right and then it's timings and then you kind of bring those together and you have your end output latency um, and so uh, there's a lot of default logic though that people say that automatically just always get lower timings and that's always better um, but that assumes that your primary timings which are the values that kind of get communicated a lot are always going to be the most important. So if I head back over here, because I think I'm running that test right now. So if I just look at this screenshot uh, for the UEFI, and here we take a look at this uh, image, we can see right here that again, 6,000, right? And then we have timing, so 32, 38, 38, 80, right? Um, the lower this value, the better. Now there is generally some truth to that, that generally usually the lower the value, but it's not always a full indicator of the performance of the kit. You could actually have some situations where some timings could be higher um, in terms of, let's say, the primary timings, but sub sub timings are actually different and that could actually have better performance. And this can be kind of confusing because sometimes people will take two kits, they'll put them together and they'll think on paper, this one should be faster or this one should perform better, but on this one, it actually performs better. And that's because the timings, uh, which there are a whole bunch of them, uh, some timings are more uh, important to some application workloads than others, right? And it really kind of depends on how that timing has been optimized. And that gets a little bit to kind of what we talked about with like the XMP where we did like the XMP tweaked, where we try to make sometimes a tweak to some of these values where we know that that actually really gives us a performance uplift. And it might not actually change any of those primary timings. It changes tertiary timings um, that actually tend to have more of a performance impact. Um, where this ultimately though probably affects the user more is Tighter timings tend to require memory that has more voltage. So if you're maybe manually making an adjustment or if you're even buying kits of memory, um, a lot of people don't account for this, but the tighter that frequency is and also that higher that, that uh, memory divider is, right? Generally, it's gonna be more voltage. So uh, if I again go back here to my uh, screenshot, uh, your base value for DDR5, right, is 1.1 volt. You can see already right here, we've got 1.35, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. You could be looking at like 1.45, right? So that's actually quite a bit more voltage, right? It's producing, uh, consuming more power, producing more heat. And same thing, if, if you wanted to push a kit of memory more, so you want to try to get more performance out of it, you might also have to increase the voltage. Um, so that's, you know, just, Something I guess keep in mind for, for timings, but um, generally I'd say the, the rule of thumb, right? Your default is C40. So anything below that, great. Um, but you don't generally have to kind of go from the perspective that you have to absolutely get the kind of the lowest value. It is uh, generally gonna be a good rule that the lower, generally the better performance will be, but there are other sub timings that can sometimes have a bigger effect on performance. We'll have to do that test for creators run some of the benchmarks with the same frequency, but lower timings and then see how much does this have effect to having the lower timings and then do the different frequencies to see what the performance difference is. That will be interesting. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's also the other thing too, is some applications treat things differently. Um, you know, uh, a lot of times in the very beginning, there was the discussion on like how much DDR5 provided you a benefit. And one really important part of DDR5 is because its bandwidth is so much higher than DDR4, it provides more bandwidth to each one of the CPU cores. And so the more multi-threaded an application, generally the more that DDR5 shines, if that makes sense, right? The less multi-threaded uh, the where the application, the less that you will generally find that DDR5 is gonna provide an immediate performance impact, right? Um, but if you have an application that's using a lot of these threads because it actually, actually has to feed from the DDR uh, channels, right? You actually are supplying that to the cores. You actually get a performance uplift. So the best multi-threaded performance will always come from 
uh, DDR5, and then also higher bandwidth DDR5. So, you know, creators that are do doing maybe more workflows, I'd say like on the videography, animation, uh, production workflow type side, they would probably see more benefit. If you're somebody like me, like I'm a hobbyist in doing a photography, and then I do some moderate kind of video editing. On the photography side, I get some stuff, but you would have to really do like a lot of decompression or um, compression, which would use more cores to see more of a bandwidth perspective. So like when I go and take pictures of my dog, if I filled up like a full like 64 gig, uh, you know, SD card with like tons and tons and tons of raw, and then I'm gonna batch convert all my raw to maybe, you know, some JPEGs or something like that, I could start to use a lot of cores under that situation, specifically under that batch conversion, then I would see more benefit from DRAM bandwidth. But in some other situations, if it's more just CPU centric, right, then, you know, the memory being between like 6,000 to like 66 to like 7,000, you might not notice any, almost any performance benefit. So yeah, so exactly. Mind, the more um, the application use more cores, probably you'll see more benefit from more bandwidth. Yeah, so for example, people who are doing Lightroom, they're wedding photographers, they're doing, they load a lot of photos and then they batch export them to something else and Lightroom Classic very well utilizes the multi-cores. But then at the same time, if you're working for Cinema 40 and the Cinema Entire 23, you're doing the test, you got a really, you know, fast kit of RAM, paid a lot of money, you're not gonna see any performance difference in Cinema Entire 23. It's only the difference when you're working with a lot of data that needs to go through the RAM right when we see the benefit of multi-threaded and then the big RAM capacity and the like faster speeds that's where we see see that like in video editing like you said and photo editing yeah that's where it's always important of course you know just you pick the right platform that favors the application that you're working at right where you got to look at frequency you have to look at the IPC right so the instructions per clock you got to look at you know ring bus you got to look at DRAM you know all these little different pieces on how they influence your ultimate your workflow right Thank you very much for your time. I think that's uh, it for me. Our last thing is, did that memory test pass now, or is it? Oh, let, let, let's see. Let's see. Did it did it pass or did it? Oh, there it goes. Yeah. Look at that. So like I. So I was correct. I knew it was going to fail there. So this is normal <laughs> as is expected here. But as you can see right there, it did find errors. But I picked a configuration that I knew would be able to error, but not generally hopefully crash with a with yeah. a, a, a stop error, so that you could see what it might look like if you maybe had a crash in Windows that was maybe marginal, so the system could still work. Like, you could still open browser, maybe things yeah. would be still working, but you wouldn't get a full crash. So yeah. at this point, um, like I said, the next step would be, you could do a couple of different things. You could, one, you could go attempt to try maybe those DRAM dividers. Uh, you could attempt to maybe relax the, um, the memory timing, maybe by like a value of one. So like if maybe it's like a C30 kit, you could try to bump up maybe the primary timing of like C32, if you wanted to, you could also attempt to maybe make an adjustment there to the, the DRAM voltage. But, um, you know, that's kind of up to you. Just depends on, 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 you know, what your kind of goal is, right? What you're trying to. But generally, if you, you know, you, you kind of distill this all down to a lot of what we talked about, if you try to generally try to be sensible about what you picked, then, you know, you should probably yeah. have a pr pretty good success at probably not running into an issue, right? That's uh, it from me. Thank you very much for taking the time to explain RAM and XMP to us. Fantastic, man. Thank you.